businesses that generate high returns can reinvest at a great rate, which typically means strong management team, good industry structure, um, and uh, also a business with structural growth. I think that's often the sort of trick within investment markets is just, there's often very few things that are really important. And I think a lot of people get caught up in stuff that's, that's really interesting, but it's not important. Invest in the company knowing that you're stacking the odds in your favor and that um, over the next, say, three to five years, you've got a great opportunity, a great possibility of maybe, you know, um, getting two or three times your money back. The market's dealing in heuristics and rules of thumb. It's not dealing in specifics because it, at that point, we don't have a lot of the data. We don't really understand. All we can judge is the second derivative. In a cyclical downturn, you need the balance sheet in great shape because you need to come out the other side. There was already some big structural trends happening pre-COVID and, and COVID has accelerated those trends. My parents and family were generally in small business and I guess I was always interested in um, you know, how businesses make money. So really from a very early age, I was always interested in that, how businesses make money. I was interested in the markets, um, you know, through my parents as well. I did, in my undergrad, I did sort of business and commerce, so which I thought was the, the best way. If you're generally interested in businesses, that's the best way to, to, to get into it. I uh, came out, finished that and actually started um, in account in an accounting firm, but I went into the management consulting division of an accounting firm. Uh, and this was back in the, in the eighties. And, uh, but back then the, the, we, in the management consulting, we used to do, um, really sort of and that, in, in Queensland, which I started, I, I came out of Brisbane, um, uh, a lot of it was done around property and, and uh, mixed use developments, tourism development. So we used to do a lot of um, feasibility studies for um, mixed use developments, property developments. I just loved it. It was, very, it was fascinating. But the interesting thing was when, when the management consulting division was busy, we used to bring people from corporate finance. And when corporate finance was busy, uh, the management consulting team would go and help them in corporate finance. And I also just loved the corporate finance work. So there was a lot of deregulation work that they were doing and, and same sort of valuing businesses. And I just absolutely loved uh, that side of it. I said to the guys in corporate finance, well, if I want to do this, I want to get in more, more into this, what do I do? And they said, basically get yourself to business school um, and use that as an opportunity to, to, to make that transition. And that's exactly what I did. I um, applied to London Business School um, and got in and, and did a Masters of Finance at London Business School. This is now sort of mid, mid to late 90s and just loved it. I guess the thing, when I, and London Business School had, did have a big impact on me and a big influence. I guess where I'd, I'd started more on corporate finance, but having gone through uh, that postgraduate degree, I, I, I felt like... Um, funds management, um, investment industry was much more sort of my cup of tea. And that would be, you know, where I'd use all the, it had all the good elements, but without the sort of negative elements, I guess. Uh, and then basically very fortunate to join Fidelity straight out of business school um, and started with Fidelity in our London office as, a, um, uh, uh, as an equity analyst uh, and basically worked my way up work my way through that time. The, the beauty of being in a big global firm like Fidelity is you get to learn from, uh, you know, incredible world-class, well, famous portfolio managers, whether that's Peter, and I had a great um, opportunity to spend some time with Peter Lynch in Boston or Anthony Bolton in London um, or Rich Fenton in the Boston office as well. And I always, you know, I was always amazed at, how generous they were with their time and how, you know, how much they, how much time they spent with young people of the firm and, 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 uh, you know, trying to give them their, their experience. So they, they were all very sort of formative years. And, you know, I, I still say I'm sort of learning. I still say I'm learning now, um, 23 years in at Fidelity, I'd still say I'm learning, learning investments, learning the business, but you know, they were great, great foundations, um, you know, over that 23 years. Are there any anecdotes of, that you could share? I mean, obviously meeting uh, Peter Lynch is a, uh, an absolute master of the market, a real, a real um, funds management legend. Are there any anecdotes that you can share just to give, give us a bit of a sense of what it was like meeting those people? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was there's slightly different ones. So I remember um, uh, when Peter Lynch came over to London. Uh, in one of the times I was uh, at that point, I started as an analyst and then started, um, you know, becoming the sector leader. And I actually became the global um, financials leader uh, based in London. I remember Peter Lynch came out to came from Boston out, out to London, and basically my job was to look after him for the day, um, effectively pick him up at the airport, take him because we had a, basically a full day of uh, full day of meetings and in sort of internal sort of investment discussion. And um, that was just a fascinating insight into, because I'd previously, when I'd gone to Boston, I'd always had a chat with him, but it was, very, they were, I guess they were typically shorter in nature. Um, when I had the whole day with him, it was just a fascinating, um, fascinating exposure. And the, everybody's quite different. I guess investors are quite different in the way they go about it. And um, I, the other one that had a big influence, Anthony Bolton, who was a, a local London PM, had a big influence on me as well. And they were quite different people. So Peter Lynch was at a million miles an hour. So um, he would be doing multiple things. You know, he was the ultimate uh, multitasker. He'd be doing a million things at once. He'd be talking to you, doing something else, speaking on the phone. Um, and you, you basically get dizzy, um, you know, just trying to stay, you know, he, I, I just effectively just trying to keep up with him was, was an incredible, um, I mean, I couldn't do it basically. Uh, and just to see how his mind works and how he focuses on, you know, a million different things at once and, and, and looks at it. And, and, and I guess when those very senior guys, you can see that they work out very quickly what's important and what's not important. And that's, and they hone in on that very, very quickly. And I think that's often the sort of trick within investment markets is just, there's often very few things that are really important. And I think a lot of people get caught up in stuff that's that's really interesting, but it's not important. That, those guys focused in on it um, very quickly. I did also, um, Anthony Bolton was in the London, he's probably the senior portfolio manager in our London office. And I did spend a lot of time with Anthony over the years. And he was, he was a little bit different. He, I mean, he was a fantastic investor, but he was much more, um, I guess, slow in thought, um, much more, um, You'd think through, think through it, and um, just the time involved in it. But I, but I distinctly remember, you know, one of the worst things in the um, so London office is quite a big office, and Boston office is a big office. And when I was when I first started as an analyst, you one of the worst things that could happen is you know you recommend you, you you put a rating out on a, on a stock, and then you're recommending that all the portfolio managers buy that company. Now, you, you know, you wake up one morning and that company's had a profit warning and you've, and you've got everybody into that stock. It's a nightmare scenario because basically what you have to do is walk around the entire office and tell all of the portfolio managers who you got into that, who you got into that stock, you know, that this company's just had a profit warning, the shares are down, you know, five or 10% or, or whatever it is and explain to them, you know, what you did, what you missed, what you got wrong. And then, you know, what the outcome is. And, um, I always talked about it's basically an hour long walk of shame around the office, you know, what, what you got wrong. And, but I, you know, it's very, what I think was very instructional. So that's a great, um, you know, that was incredible humility you had to have to you know, go around and tell you continually telling different people why you got things wrong or what you did wrong. But I, you know, the younger portfolio managers, um, might have been a bit tougher on you and they you know like it was probably more important to them or they were much more focused on the short term and and you know occasionally got a few things thrown at me as i went into people's office or you know yelled at or whatever and that but when you went to anthony you know it was completely um it, you know anthony you know we, we, to me it, there's a great quote in uh, one of jim collins books uh, good to great and that to me that really captured anthony which was it was sort of like an autopsy without blame. So he'd go, um, you know, and he, his reaction to me, whether that stock had a massive profit upgrade or a massive profit downgrade, his reaction was always the same, which was, come, come on, Paul, come into the office, sit down, let's get, let's go through it. Um, and, you know, his, like I said, his reaction was completely indifferent, whether it was positive news or, or, or bad news. And I really took that, took away, that's, you know, it was such a sensible approach. It was basically a data-led approach. 
you know, give me all the information, give me all the data. Uh, let's work, you know, should we, you know, we got, have we got the thesis wrong and we should be selling it or, or is it just um, a, you know, a speed bump in the road? The one follow on thing from that, Paul, you, you've talked about the people that have influenced you and some great stories there. Just wondering if there's a period of time in markets where markets have had, you know, an event or a company or, or some kind of um, exposure that you've had from the investing itself rather than the people that, that's also influenced you. Um, definitely. So when I think, I was just trying to work out the other day, I, you know, over 23 years at Fidelity, and I guess within the investment world, I've only ever worked at Fidelity. So I guess that's the, the, the first point. But I think over that 23 years, I've gone through about 10 different crises. So my first one was the Asian crisis back in uh, 97. We had the Russian bond default. We had the tech wreck. We had LTCM. Um, we had September 11, um, uh, you know, global financial crisis, sovereign debt crisis, SARS, and, and now COVID. And I think I've taken a little bit from all of those different ones, but I guess the one that sticks in my mind, probably because it was the first one, was actually the Asian crisis. And I remember, so I I just started in the in the London office as a young uh, equity analyst. And my first sector was uh, engineering, diversified industrial. So um, they were, they're sort of, a, that's a deep cyclical sector. And they were heavily exposed to Asia because those sort of heavy equipment, um, deep cyclical, they were high, they were very highly tied to Asian growth. So when the Asian crisis came along, um, the stocks were just collapsing. Um, and this was back in uh, sort of 19, 1997. Uh, stocks were just collapsing. I mean, I'm a young guy just out of business school thinking, oh goodness, you know, what's happening here? What, what, how do I go about, what do I do here? How do I go about investing? Um, because they were it was really a precipitous fall. I, 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 I so distinctly remember um, having a chat with uh, one of our portfolio managers in the Boston office, a guy called Rich Fenton. Now Rich, um, he was our deep value fund manager and fantastic guy. Like I said, you know, spent a lot of time. And I, I simply remember sitting down with him and, he, and basically giving me a lesson in um, sort of deep cyclical investing. And, you know, his, his advice was really, you really need to just, there's, there's a couple of different points here. One is, first of all, the, the balance sheet needs to be strong enough that this company gets out to the other side. So, we're now going into a going into a crisis, but they need to have the balance sheet to come out the other side because if they don't have the balance sheet, you're not going to get the upside from that investment. And then he said, "Look, in these sort of crisis these crisis periods, you, you also need to be not focused on typically normal valuation metrics, but more typically hard asset backed valuation metrics. So that could be, um, you know, a net net book value, net asset value." could be like an enterprise value to sales, enterprise value to order book. Um, basically he said in this environment, just forget about profit because you know, that's, that there's nothing, you know, you'll go at the leverage in these businesses, you'll go into loss very quickly. And then if they've got the balance sheet to get to the other side, and if um, they go through sort of long run trough valuation bottom so in those ones i gave so you know if you if you've got a um price to book value that's now back to 0.5 and that's typically been the trough um spot or a enterprise value to sales and maybe a troughs at 0.4 times enterprise value to sales and it gets to 0.4 and it's got the balance sheet and you like the business and you like the sort of longer term uh, growth in the business Basically, you need to step off the cliff and invest in that invest in that company. Now he said that just because it's just because it, it troughs at 0.4 times EV to sales doesn't mean it can't go to 0.3 times EV to sales. But when you buy it at trough and you've got the balance sheet and you like the management team and you like the long term of the business, you're basically stacking all the odds in your favour, and it might go to 0.3. But you know that maybe the average valuation through a cycle might be one times EV to sales. You know when you're picking it up at 0.4, you're you're stacking everything in your favour to maybe get you know two or three times your money 
um, over the next, say, three to five years. And that's the sort of critical thing. And that, that's very, you know, it's easy to say, it's actually very hard to execute. And I often find, um, and that's, inve that's, that's investing as well. Like investing, it's, it's a pretty simple thesis or simple theory. Investment theory is quite simple. It's actually executing it that's, that's very, very difficult because at that time as well, the stocks are just collapsing and you know someone else would say it's it's you know you you got to be careful because it's like trying to catch a falling knife and that's exactly what it felt like but when you've done your homework when you've got all the numbers in line and you've hit that trough valuation um you you need to step off step off the cliff and invest in the company knowing that you're stacking the odds in your favor and that um over the next say three to five years you've got a great opportunity a great possibility or maybe you know um, getting two or three times your money back. Yeah, interesting. Well, I'm very keen to hear about how you're stacking the odds in your favour in the, <laughs> in the current market. We're going to get into that um, very brief, uh, very shortly. A bit about how you are investing. Just, I guess, just to sum up on some of that background story, just really quickly, if you distill that down and you tell people how do you how you invest today and in non-technical and finance jargon terms, like how do you now think about investing? Like what's in your portfolio and, and how does it reflect your philosophy? Um, I guess fundamentally what I'm looking for um, is, uh, you know, the, the, if once again, if I look at, you know, so I've had the, well, I've been at Fidelity now for 23 years. We've had, I've been managing the Fidelity Australian Equities Fund from its inception which was now seven, over 17 years ago. And if I look at the last 17 years of the fund, the, the, what, what's really driven um, the very strong performance you highlighted at, at the start is what I generally call as compounders. So they're businesses that really come and, and you know, that's one of the, the sort of magical as, at, um, aspects of finance is, is really, com if you can compound, you can really create value over the long term. That's not a short term thing. That's a long term thing. And typically that the attributes of those compounding businesses are they're high return businesses. And importantly, they can reinvest at a high rate because that's, that's the important thing. So if they're earning a 20% return on investment or a 20% um, ROIC return on invested capital, if they can reinvest at 20%, that's going to really create, you're going to get earnings upgrades and that's going to be, create a lot of value through that, through that reinvestment. Now to get for those high return businesses and to reinvest at a high rate, um, you know, you need things like, you know, we're very focused on the quality of the management team. But now we think a good quality management team makes a difference at any point of the cycle, but will particularly make, um, a difference when things are a little bit tougher. Industry structures, uh, very important. There's a great uh, Warren Buffett quote that um, if a, a good management team meets a poor industry structure, it's the industry structure that will keep its reputation. Um, and that, so you got to, they got to be to get, they've got to be together. You've got to have a good industry structure uh, and an ability to earn those higher returns. Then you got to have a you know, good management team um, you know, that can, that can put in place a great strategy for that company to, to flourish. Um, and then, you know, a lot of things like we spent a lot of time working, focus on the balance sheet, making sure, because, you know, even if you've got all those things, you can, sometimes you can just get unlucky, just, you know, so, you know, you can be a great company, good position and along comes COVID and you just get, you just get unlucky. But if you've got your balance sheet in a good spot, you, you, once again, you're stacking the odds in your favor and you make sure that even when you get a little bit unlucky, it, it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. And it's, you know, I always look at it. Um, you really just don't want to be a forced seller and that's the company themselves. You don't want to be a forced seller at any point in time. And if you've got your finances in order, it just means that you'll, you'll potentially never be a forced seller and you can always realize the right, the right value in that, um, in that business. So very focused on, um, businesses that generate high returns can reinvest at a great rate, which typically means strong management team, good industry structure, um, and uh, also a business with structural growth. And, you know, when we talk about COVID, you know, a lot of those really, you got to be focused on those long-term structural growth trends. That's if you get that, you know, nice 
tailwind that can be very beneficial for the company and, and, and for the industry. And a lot of the time those tailwinds, you know, will hang around for a long period of time. Well, let's, let's talk about the world that we're in now and how it's, how it's changed over the past nine months and 10 months. You and I were talking previously about, you know, some of the changes we've been experiencing with our work. Talk me through how you've, you've moved the portfolio around some of the opportunities and, and, and I guess focus on some of the changes that you, you felt like you wanted to make um, in this environment. Um, and I, I guess coming back to something you talked about earlier, which was working, about, working out the things that one or two things that really do matter. Um, mm. I'd just be keen to, to hear you talk about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, look, a very interesting, you know, very interesting time. Um, and as I talked about, you know, over my 23 years, I've, I've, this is, I think this is my 10th crisis. So I've had plenty of crisis experience and they seem to happen more often than you think they're going to happen. You didn't um, get angry at this crisis when it came around, Paul? Well, say that again, sorry? You didn't get angry at this crisis when it came around and gave you a bit of bad news? No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I learned from Anthony and just, you just, you know, you just uh, take it as it is and, and, uh, and try and assess the situation and, and try and stay as calm as, try not to get emotional, try and stay as calm as, as possible. But the interesting thing was, that, you know, so I've, um, over that 23 years, I, I, I spent a lot of time in London, but also uh, lived in Boston. But prior to coming back to Australia, I actually had, I was up in Hong Kong. And the funny thing was, I was actually based in Hong Kong when SARS hit. Um, so I had a bit of a taste of what, you know, what, and that was an eerie place when, when SARS hit Hong Kong as well. Um, but I think in the early stage of any of these crises, you sort of working, it's an interesting sort of dynamic because you're really, you, you, you having to use judgment. So right at the start of COVID-19, we didn't really have a lot of data. This is something that's new. We could, you know, SARS was probably the closest that we had to it, SARS or MERS, et cetera. But we didn't have a lot of data. And so you're using a lot of judgment. And in those early periods, um, that judgment typically will be based on previous crises, what's happened in those. Um, will Typically people use a lot of sort of heuristics, which are um, basically rules of thumb or you know what typically happens in this environment. And that's what happens early. So when we, one of the things I've learned over many, many of these crises is, the most important thing, we come back to that, you know, there's one, one thing that matters in a, in a crisis early on when you don't have a lot of data and you're just trying to make, um, you know, you, you're basing it on heuristics is, um, is the second derivative. So markets typically focus on the second derivative. Now, when I say the second derivative, that means that's not the absolute numbers, that's sort of rate of change. So, you know, in a car, that's acceleration or deceleration, not, not the actual speed of going 60 kilometers an hour, it's the acceleration into it or the deceleration. And I think the markets, so it, it, under the COVID, that was the acceleration of new cases or the deceleration. So as you accelerate, as, you're, as, you, as it's starting to peak and you're getting that second derivative that goes flat, that's typically when markets think you're heading to some sort of bottom. And that's typically when people, um, you know, start to get a little bit more confident. So now we saw and in COVID, we initially saw that under that first wave that happened at, at the end of March. And the amazing thing was it was almost to the day that the second derivative changed that the market bottomed. Now, once again, you're sort of, you're sort of making, you know, very broad based judgments and not very specific, but that's, that's the markets dealing in heuristics and rules of thumb. It's not dealing in specifics because it, at that point, we don't have a lot of the data. We don't really understand. All we can judge is the second derivative. And I think markets do focus on the second derivative because often it is typically the point of maximum pain. So when you're accelerating up something, you know, governments are taking the, the most extreme action. People are panicking the most. The uncertainty is the highest. And as you move from accelerating to flattening, that's typically a point of maximum. That's typically the point of maximum pain, which, you know, the market reflects that. So we had a very sharp decline, second derivative change market bottom. Now, so then the market sort of, you know, started to recover as, 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 
that second derivative started to move now to a decelerate from a flat, from accelerating to flat to decelerating. Um, and we, but we also, the important thing is we started to get more and more data. So we started to understand COVID-19, you know, what the impacts, how, it, you know, what, what was a great way to treat, you know, if you look around the world, what was a great way to treat COVID-19? Um, and we're still, you know, we, we definitely haven't got all the information and we're still working all that out, but we've got a lot more data today than we did back in, back in the start of the year. Um, now, you know, as we, so that was the important point. So I think the first point was, which we highlighted, you know, you really need to focus on the second derivative and, and investing in late March has really helped us, you know, over that period. The other thing we sort of thought over that time was maybe there was three places to invest, you know, at the end of March. Uh, one was, uh, we thought was technology, one was resources, and then the other one was probably heavily impacted sectors like travel, uh, travel and tourism, but very selectively into capital raises as they needed, because they really, the same thing as I talked about with the deep cyclical, they need to have their balance sheet in, pristine condition. So, you know, if, if, we've, if they've got no revenues for two years, they need to survive to the other side to benefit from the, uh, from the uplift when, when, you know, when the return comes. So technology, because what we saw, and this is the other thing that happens typically at a start of a crisis, is that the market shoots first and asks questions second. Now, so it's typically an indiscriminate sell-off, everything, and that's, so tech and everything came off initially and then people go, oh, hang on a second. Um, tech's actually quite well placed in this. And, and, and now I'm actually able to pick up a really high quality company at a, at a very much better valuation. And they've got, if I look out sort of five years, I've got a great runway, a great traje trajectory. And this is a great you know, entry point into what is a really good stock. Because you've got long-term positive uh, fundamentals. Uh, now, the other thing is resources. One of the arguments was uh, one of the, you know, once again, keeping it simple and just focusing on what's important. There was also an argument that China was the first in, so we'll be the first out. And obviously a lot of the resource sector is highly linked to China's demand. And that's what we've seen. China was the first in, was the first out. So actually demand coming out of China is now quite, quite strong. Um, and in particular, we've seen it in the iron ore sector. And, and not only has their demand been strong, but, but um, you know, competitors like Brazil have really suffered under COVID-19. So we've had a supply contraction and a, and a strong demand. So that's been, you know, you know, Australia has been in a very strong position in the iron ore market. So the resource sector was already very cheap, already high cash flow, already really attractive balance sheet. So it's very strong balance sheet. And on a China first in, first out, that was another, um, you know, good place to, to, to invest. So we did, we hit technology, resources, and then we also made, um, you know, select, I'd say sort of highly selective, um, investments in companies that were more heavily impacted by COVID, but were using that capital raise to repair their balance sheet um, and make sure they're in a position to get to the other side. And that was, um, you know, we, we invest in companies like Ramsey Healthcare because the hospitals were heavily impacted. Uh, oil search because oil demand was heavily impacted. Um, and, you know, if you, and, and a range, Vista and a range of other companies, but they were much, much more selective and much more focused on um, capital raises. What about some of the more directly exposed travel names, your things like your, your Qantas and your Sydney airports, uh, Flight Centre, for example, some of these, you know, sort of right in the firing line travel names? So um, I haven't done any of the one. The one we did do through a capital raise was Hello World. Um, so I guess that's very similar to a Flight Centre style. Um, yeah. But once again, you know, we, we invested through the capital raise and we think they're well positioned and, uh, and uh, you know, being managed well. Uh, but, you know, that could be a long, you know, and they really need to make sure their balance sheet's in a good spot. So because this could be a, this could be a long, this could be a long run. Um, and also you still don't want to have, I don't think it wants to be a major position. So um even selectively investing in some of those names and that's the one we did within the that sort of tourism space um you don't 
I don't think you want it to be a major position in your portfolio because you still want to get, leave yourself sort of ammunition in case something hap you know, more happens later down the track. And I think this is a really, this is going to be a long run slug. So good price, good opportunity. Um, repairing the balance sheet puts them in a position that, you know, they can withstand a bad cycle for, for the next couple of years. But um, I still don't, you probably still don't want to bet the farm on it because um, I think it's still a little bit unknown how people will react uh, post COVID as well. I think, I think Pete, there, I think there is a lot of pent up demand to return to, you know, cruising and holidays, et cetera. But I just think it might take a little while before, you know, people become very comfortable, very comfortable with that. But I think the interesting thing, and now what we're looking at now, so move on from, from the start of the year, where we're probably spending more time now is that I think the really interesting thing here is that, even when we come out post COVID, the world is not going to, you know, even if we return to some sort of semi normalcy, we're definitely going to be still very different from what we were pre COVID. And um, I think there's the interesting thing was there was already some big structural trends happening pre COVID and, the, and COVID has accelerated those trends. So you look at something like e-commerce now e-commerce was growing, was, was structurally growing pre COVID, COVID's really accelerated that. Now that's been obviously positive for those businesses that have a strong online presence and, and negative for, you know, several um, bricks and mortar retailers, but sort of depending upon what area you're in. But that's, that's, a, that's a trend that's accelerated through COVID. It's also one where, um, you know, we're not going back to where we were pre-COVID either, you know. So people have, a lot of this, a lot of this online buying has now become a habit and I think people are going to do it more and more. I was talking to um, some colleagues the other day, um, or no, just a, just a group of friends actually. And uh, you know, one of them said, look, I've ordered so much stuff online. I don't even know what, what's coming anymore. And I think, well, actually that's complete, that's completely changed your behavior. Uh, and that's sort of, you know, and it, it, once that becomes a habit and you, it's worked well and you like it, you know, that habit will continue. So those sort of trends accelerated and that <coughs> they'll stay on the other side. Digital delivery of food and beverage, same sort of thing. You know, Domino's has done very well through, um, through COVID-19 because people want food delivered to their home or, or wherever they are. That was a trend that was happening pre-COVID, got accelerated through COVID and will probably continue to grow post-COVID. So they're in a really good position. Work from home, another... Um, you know, strong thematic that was happening pre-COVID, accelerated through COVID, will likely um, continue even post-COVID. Um, you know, nesting is another one, you know, infrastructure development. Uh, even, you know, if you look at the retail sector, one of the other things that's happened is a move away from formal wear. So, you know, and here we are here. Maybe if we had this interview uh, a year ago, we'd both be in suits. Today, we're much more casual and uh, everyone I talk to loves this sort of more casual approach. And um, so move away from formal wear, but, but the thing that's really grown is active wear. So active wear has been fantastic. And also, you know, an unusual stat, but, you know, um, joggers and, and sort of athletics shoes have been a very strong sell off through this, through this period as well. So they were trends pre, you know, all that sort of casualization. That was a trend pre COVID accelerated through COVID and will likely to remain there post COVID. And they probably now that those bigger trends is where we're spending more of our time because that's the other thing I think with COVID there's, you know, we talk about the market, but it's really the, the, there's, there's huge winners and there's huge losers from this environment. Um, and those, those, thematics have really driven that big divide. So we just think you need to be really stock specific, really business specific, um, you know, in this sort of world. And that, and, and COVID, if anything, has is, is sort of, you know, moved the winners and losers much further apart. So we're spending more of our time on that. And we're spending much more time now on that than we were sort of thinking about it, you know, from a market perspective early on. I do want to ask uh, one of my favourite questions, which is getting you to, to Give us a, a quick yarn about a mistake that you made, something that was a bit painful, um, but importantly, um, taught you a lesson that has made you a better investor. So maybe we could 
wrap up with just a, a, a quick story about a lesson you learned along the way? Yes, definitely. Um, and unfortunately, over 23 years, I've learned an awful lot of lessons as well. <laughs> I always talk about learning lessons two ways. You can learn it the hard way, which is me making mistakes. You can learn it the easy way, which is someone else making the mistake and me learning from that, that person. But unfortunately, I've made, you know, uh, hopefully I've learned more the easy way, learning from other people, but I've definitely learned uh, lessons the hard way as well. The interesting thing when I, when I talked about, um, you know, looking at the fund over 17 years and that all of the really positive contributors were those sort of compounding businesses, we similarly have looked at, well, what have been the detractors? You know, what hasn't worked over the 17 years? And there hasn't been any consistent themes. And the, the negative ones, there probably has been two, two areas that I've made mistakes and I'm continually trying to make sure I don't make those mistakes again. But I think they're both characterized by, um, you know, sort of two, two styles of investment. So one, one, so if I looked at the negative attribution over that whole 17 years, um, two stocks were the worst two, which were um, Ilu investment in Iluca. And the second one was an investment in Billabong. Um, but probably more than those individual companies, because, you know, they're both uh, good companies. It was really the context of that investment as well. So Luca was an interesting one. And if you, if you go back to pre, pre-07, um, they were, we saw the Zircon, so um, we saw the Zircon price really rising, industrial mineral prices were really rising. And at the time there was an argument that, well, hang on, normally that, you know, so you've got in anything like this, you've got cyclical drivers and, and structural drivers. And often the lesson from all of this is when, you know, if they're normally cyclical and then everyone's saying, oh, this, it's a change, it's structural, it's typically not. It's really cyclical and you get fooled into the fact that it's structural. And I think that's what happened with Iluca. So um, Zircon price was strong, industrial minerals were strong. There was an argument that it was, the market was consolidating um, and the prices would stay high, um, you know, for the long term. And this was structural growth. Now, it wasn't cyclical growth. But what you also find in those, when prices get high is that companies look for substitutes, substitution. And companies found other ways around it and didn't have to get that product or, or got less of that product. Um, and basically the prices and, and new, new um, supply came on and, and the price collapsed. So um, that, that, was, that was- that, that supply and demand relationship in the commodities market seems to be quite efficient very efficient and like i said when when something has been cyclical and you th and you think oh no it's different this time it's typically not different this time it is still it's still cyclical so and i look at that for a lot of businesses as well every time i hear someone saying oh it's a cyclical business but it's changed and it's now structural i go oh, you know that very few times does a business move from cyclical to structural that's that that doesn't happen often and that that was the mistake that happened in Iluca. And also, um, I think it's still one we can, you know, and I'm always asking myself, is this cyclical or structural? Um, but more often than not, um, it doesn't change its spots. Um, so that's the first one, you know, that demand supply and cyclical versus structural. The second one I think is related to balance sheet. And that's the next most common mistake. So cyclical, getting cyclical structural wrong. And the other one um, that's a common mistake is, is not, um, not quite getting the balance sheet because that when the balance sheet's not right, that's when you can get into trouble as well. So Billabong was a good example. Billabong um, sold their products, sold their products. So they were the manufacturer, but they would sell to the retailer. And what was happening was, um, so they were selling to companies like Pacific Brands in the US and Pacific Brands were doing a whole lot of private label. They were doing their own shorts and shirts and things. They'd put Billabong at the back of the store They'd force people to walk through the store to get to the Billabong, but you'd have to go through all the Pacific Brands products. And that was all the cheaper private label type things. Um, so Billabong was getting nervous that their, the retailers were coming in. They were now starting to compete with the retailer. So, oh, you know, so Billabong started to buy retail outlets. Now, you know, that you can, and now they started to more directly compete with their um, customers. But, the other thing that did that was putting more and more strain on their balance sheet and they were having to put it. 
And we looked at it and the market was getting very concerned about the fashionability of Billabong. We did a lot of research on, on a lot of the social networks and still thought, well, it's actually, it's still being talked about in a very positive way. And um, young people are still positive about Billabong. Um, and we weren't overly negative and, and the stock was sort of cheap. So we weren't overly negative about the retail, but not only were the, the retail them spent that not only were they spending money on buying the retail operations but there was a massive working capital blowout which also impacted which was which was probably the area that we hadn't fully factored into the, the analysis so like i said in some in, when we were talking about it a little bit earlier you, you need the balance sheet needs to be in a great shape in a in a cyclical downturn you need the balance sheet in great shape because you need to come out the other side and if you can't come out the other side, you're not going to benefit from the, the, ups, ups, the cyclical upswing. And as that moved on, we got more and more nervous um, about the cyclical downturn in Billabong and the balance sheet was deteriorating very quickly from both buying the businesses, but also the working capital uh, blowouts as well. So um ended up we i mean we we got out of it we made a loss it wasn't a it wasn't a it wasn't a huge loss but it was still a negative we sort of took our medicine and you know took our medicine and, and moved on but um i think those two are the sort of they're, they're probably areas where they're the most common mistakes i guess cyclical you know confusing cyclical and structural and also not um and, and, and balance sheet can catch you out as well so we spent a lot of time on both of those trying to make sure we don't, um, you know, we don't make the same mistakes again. Great. Well, Paul, um, thanks again for taking the time to sit down with us. Really enjoyed hearing some of those stories and particularly about the philosophy that, that underpins your thinking. Um, and yeah, again, appreciate you taking the time to sit down and have a chat. Thank you. Excellent. That was great. Really enjoyed it.